Welcome to day two of Africa Rights 2021 and the themes of imagination, pleasure and activism and it's, it's just been incredible to see people back in person and to know that there's so many more people tuning in online as well. So thank you for being here. My name is Desta Haile and I'm the Deputy Director of the Royal African Society. Um, we have an incredible lineup today. So just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, so welcome, we'll be taking your questions online and in-house. Um, if you're watching online, you can submit your questions using the question box below the video. And for the audience in the theater, just raise your hand and someone will come to you with a mic. Please turn off your phones or put them on silent. We're not expecting any fire alarms, so if you do hear any, please follow the emergency exit signs. Um, and uh, we will be starting with Of This Our Country. Powerful, lyrical, and entirely unforgettable, Of This Our Country weaves together a living portrait of Nigeria, one that is as beautiful as it is complex, with Chikodli, Emunlumadu, Inua Elams, and Abidare. Um, and we have Wild Imperfections at 2.30, where we will look at the work of black women and women ex-poets from Botswana to Brazil. Um, and Dismantling the Patriarchy is later on today, so please don't miss that at 5 p.m. with award-winning American-Egyptian journalist, activist, and author Mona El Tahawi um, and Dr. Leila Hossein. So we hope you can stick around the whole day and uh, welcome Bola Musuro will be chairing for us as well. And we hope you have a wonderful day. Please check out the books. Please check out the merch and uh, check out the different memberships we have as well. So you can join World African Society and uh, we can see each other more often. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Desta. Hello and welcome everybody to a very special event. As Desta said, this is of our country, of this our country. Um, and any of you who are Nigerians in the audience here in the Knowledge, Se uh, Knowledge Center Theatre at the British Library or who are joining us online will know the very question of Nigeria. What is Nigeria? How do you identify with Nigeria? What do you think about it? It's a very complex, very emotive, quite frustrating, um, sometimes very beautiful uh, question. But during the lockdown, um, two women came up with a wonderful idea. Well, they conceived a baby, um, Ore Agbaje Williams and Nancy Adimora, um, to bring together 24 writers to talk about what is Nigeria for them. And these writers have put pen to paper or finger to keyboard and spilt their guts. And I can imagine it was quite a painful process <laughs> uh, on the stage with me, Chigadili Emelumadu, and also uh, Inua Elams, who are here to talk about um, their writing. Um, but first of all, as uh, Desta said, a few housekeeping um, a few housekeeping rules, especially for those who are joining us online. Um, Please join the conversation on Twitter by following at Africa Rights UK. Um, you can use the hashtag, hashtag Africa Rights 2021. Um, and if you have any questions, any points, um, you can put them. And also, if you have any questions that you'd like to put to the panelists, um, please do so. There should be, if you're joining us online, there should be a link underneath um, by which you can pose your questions and they'll then be sent to me online and I'll try and read them. If you're here in the audience with us um, and you've graced us with your presence, please do indicate um, if we have a few um, people who are from Africa Rights and the Royal Africa Society, if you could please, or the British Library, if you could make yourself known, please, just so that people can see you if they have a question. Thank you. Do you mind standing up just so that they can see you, please, if you don't mind? And this lovely lady will come around with it. There are two of them, another lady at the back. Um, and they will come around with a microphone. If you have an issue with, um, and I can understand because of COVID, um, and you don't want to either touch the mic or speak directly, um, you can actually in, write your um, question and they will then put it online and send it to me as well. So if that's an issue for you, um, I think they can tell us how to do that. Um, also, the Royal Africa Society and Africa Rights, if you're 
Interested in Joining Africa Rights is brought to you by the Royal Africa Society, which is a Pan-African membership charity. And you can find out more about joining and supporting by visiting www.royalafricansociety.org forward slash Africa Rights. And the festival is running for the whole day today here at the British Library. Um, and it relies very much on public funding. Um, so if you'd like to donate, you can do this by visiting the Royal Africa Society website or using a link which is provided in the comments. Um, you can also, if you're interested, um, join, become a member, an arts and culture member. And I think you get 50% off Africa Rights and Film Festival um, events. Um, and at the end of the conversation and the discussion with uh, Inran and with Chigadili, um, we'll be taking questions both online and also from you here in the audience. So please, please, please do feel free um, to participate by giving your questions. Um, sadly, I have to say that we were to be joined on the stage also um, by Abby Dari, but unfortunately, um, she's taken ill today, so she won't be joining us. Um, but we also do have online, um, we have uh, four other uh, individuals who will be joining us, and uh, not joining us online, but we have readings from J.K. Chuku, from Chigozie Obioma, uh, Ayobami Adebayo, and Uma Turaki. So um, that's all. Can I ask you to welcome our panelists? <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself. I'm Bola Mosuro. So <laughs> pleased to be with you. Um, so without further ado, I mean, maybe if I can, you know, put into context what they're... And, and I hope that uh, both Ore and... Uh, also, Nancy, forgive me if I paraphrase it in this way, but the 24 essayists were asked, or the 24 writers were asked to write an essay, um, to share their memories, their thoughts, you know, their thought processes, their frustrations, whatever their heart's desire was about Nigeria reminiscing. And I'm sure it must have been very hard for each and every one of them to to say what was in their hearts or in their minds. For some, it might have actually been a rather cathartic process, um, maybe something that you've always wanted to spill out, which we'll hear uh, later on. Um, so without further ado, let's hear one of the readings. And the first reading we'll have is an online pre-recorded reading by Ayobami Adebayo. My father parks the car and goes to look for a tree. Other motorists have done the same, leaving their vehicles to go scout to go scout any form of vegetation within sight. Within sight. In this situation, in this situation, any branch would do as an olive branch. But some marker of solidarity, of solidarity is, required is required before a vehicle is left true. 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 I watched the protesters watched the through the windshield of my father's blue Santana and had the sense that the ones I have been the ones I have been about all this time. These people who are taking over the room, taking over the room. Compatriots, compatriots arriving to obey a call, to obey a call. I could not quite piece together, together from listening to my, listening to my parents' complaints about the military regime. regime. As I watch them with their watch heads and sing protest songs, songs I have never had before, I, have never had before. I, become, I sure become sure of two things. Not only are these men, men and women somehow, somehow on the angry, on the angry complaints their parents, share with, parents share, share with each other and their friends, they understand, they understand everyone and are going to do, something, are going to do about something about each discontent. I am transfixed, I am transfixed by the crowd and don't notice, and how, much notice how much time passes before my father, before my father returns with several branches. He sticks them all, sticks in, front them all in front of the car and begins to drive again, inching the Santana, inching the Santana forward, forward until I can see, until those, I can protesting see those, those protesting up close. Suddenly, suddenly, suddenly the national anthem's abstraction have crystallized into something I could touch if I tried. That was Clarion Calls by Ayobami Adebayo reading a, a short excerpt from her reading. Uh, and it was a very powerful one which took me back to 1993 when um, we had elections dissolved in Nigeria, which uh, many of you may or may not remember, you know, had been disputed by um, Ibrahim Babangida. He said the elections weren't fair and... To all intents and purposes, everybody felt that uh, MK Abiola had won the election. And we all know what then happened, what then transpired. But clearly, Ayobami was 
caught up in those protests. Maybe I can start with you, um, Inua. What did you think when you heard Ayobami's recollections of that time? Um, so in 93, I was 11. Um, so I remember being in Lagos um, and driving through a protest. We had, um, we, had a, we had a driver at the time and he had stuck an olive branch between the windscreen and the wind and the and windscreen wiper, and he expected that to, to you know to give us freedom, free reign through the traffic, but it didn't happen, and the protests were getting more and more heated, so he just opened his door and leapt out of the car and left us there, myself, my twin sister, my older sister, um, and and my mother. So my mother had to take the wheel and pilot us through. The chaos, and that's what I remembered. Wow. Yeah. And you, Chikadili, do you remember that time? Were you here um, or were you back home at that time? I was back home. I was uh, <clears throat> a hum years old. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, and I think I was in boarding school. I was in boarding school, and the one thing that um, struck me was how the entirety of the country was united in this unease and fear and just general chaos. Mm. It wasn't what we have now, which is some parts of Nigeria will sometimes have a flare-up and then other parts will go, really? There was a flare-up there? Mm. It was the whole country. Because I think this was the first time after the military rule that people felt they could speak their minds mm. or express themselves by way of voting and then being told that how you expressed yourself was wrong, it was really hard for people to deal with. So what I remember at the time was, because my boarding school had no gates, which is a long story in itself, <laughs> um, the whole, like, a lot of the teachers having to double as security and as parent figures, even more so than usual, because with teenagers, I wasn't, one at the time, but people used to sneak out mm -hmm. to go to Oweri and do parties and stuff. And they wouldn't have that. You know, the, the, that whole lax thing just completely disappeared overnight. It was like being under military rule, but much scarier because people had been within the reach of hope. They had been within the reach of deciding for themselves that they wanted this person to lead them and to have that snatched away. People couldn't deal with that at all. And I remember also being Igbo and, you know, having parents come down on you like a ton of bricks, not to speak, not to mm. say mm. anything. Mm. Don't say anything that would put not just yourself, but the entirety of the Igbo group in danger. We don't want to, we don't want them to, even though Igbo people voted majority for MKO, nobody say. wanted to kind of take that fire because Is we're because used to taking the fire. you back to the civil war. Exactly. Nobody wanted to take that fire. Nobody wanted their kids to, you know, be, to come under, under fire or to, or, to, or to draw attention to themselves and thereby spark something else. Mm. So we had a lot of chaos, but a lot of it was also like in, in families banked. Like we're talking about it inside the house. Don't go outside and open your mouth. Mm. Just mm. close your mouth. You and know? that was even you in secondary school, in, in boarding school. In boarding school, you know. Yes. And I remember, you know, I, I was here, you know, when it happened. But it took me back to, I think it was 79 when we had a similar, I guess you weren't even born at that stage, when um, we had Ali Must Go. There were students who were also demonstrating against then it was the lack of, um, a lack of resources in education. That was even when times were good. If you know mm. your parents talk to you, this is when they still got grants. Being in university was actually compared with now, it was like a holiday. You got, you know, so much in terms of um, book allocations, you know, mm. being on campus was wonderful. And yet the students were protesting, took to the streets. And again, we had to use branches in order to protect ourselves. And I remember the day that the the riots broke out and we were taking my mum to the airport, to Murtala Muhammad Airport in Lagos. And we were caught up again, like you, with your mum and, and your siblings in the car. And the students were kind of rioting and, you know, 
and they smashed all the glass. In it. My dad had a tiny um, Volkswagen Beetle and we got to the airport and had to sleep that night in the airport whilst my mum came here to the UK on the plane. And when we finally got home the day later, there was glass in, in my hair. Wow. So when I heard this happened and just reading Ayobami's story, it just took me right back. You know, and you said something there which is interesting. You said people felt that that election was within reach of hope. Yeah. That people, and I just wonder, from either of you, you know, have you seen this replicated again? Yeah, NSARS. Yeah. It was with the NSARS protest. And I mean, it's funny that, that I can only speak from Igbo culture all the time, and I do that mm. a lot, so you are going to have to deal. Um, but in Igbo culture, the practice of putting live branches is supposed to ward off evil, okay? Mm. And so I don't know f about, about it from a other, other cultural standpoint, but for us, usually when people are having things like a funeral, mm. you would have a lot of the young men, the men with the chest and things, have branches in their mouth. They're not supposed to speak. They would have branches in their mouth. And the whole purpose of it was to ward off any evil spirits that want to kind of like latch on to the world of the living because the whole idea of spirits that wander around is one, they didn't die well or they weren't buried well. Mm -hmm. And they too, they, they really want to live again. So they want to latch onto. And if you have branches or even leaves around the corners of your mouth or your outfit, on the ambulance, on cars, the idea was that it would ward them off. And so seeing that replicated in protest is a way of people wanting to hang on to their lives. Listen, we are protesting this thing, but we don't want you to kill us, okay? We don't want to die. We're just protesting this thing. And for the NSARS protest, it was, it was quite telling that people didn't even go for the norm of taking branches from trees because they didn't think it was going to work. What they did instead was to cover themselves with Nigerian flags. And we know how that worked out. It didn't work out either, you know? It just didn't work. And so I think that there is that symbolism between the warding off of evil with, with live, with live uh, vegetation or branches or whatever and the, and the flag. And in both instances, it couldn't stop the glass from being in your hair mm -hmm. and it couldn't stop bullets from piercing people's skin and mm. taking their lives. You know, it just it doesn't work, unfortunately. You know, did it, you know, make you think of either what happened last October or did it take you back to other events in our history? Um, you know, thinking that, especially when thinking we are within a, a, a reach of change, some form of change. I think it made me um, consider NSARS in a global context, which is a violence perpetrated on a, on, a, on a weaker contingent of people by the more powerful and but particularly by, by the police force. And I remember, I remember, I'll never forget when um, there were riots happening through Ferguson. There were kids in Palestine tweeting them information on how to deal with tear gas mm. because that was the globality of violence and resistance against violence. And um, a friend of mine who wrote this <laughs> magnificent essay called Why I'm No Longer Talking with Nigerians About Race, um, she, she spoke that um, the police violence was in America was exactly replicated, replicated in the NSARS. And it isn't um, along color lines, but it is still um, caged within the dynamic between the police force and people, between suppression, between, between um, those who willingly abuse power and have been systematically taught that they can do so with no um, repercussions for generations, and that's what I that's what that's what I saw. I thought is is the same dynamics here, and much much like do you remember when the um, there was a British politician who was fired for discussing how our British police force were trained by <coughs> Israeli militia? Yeah. Um, yeah, she was fired for just stating fact. Mm. Right, same thing. NYPD um, in America were trained by, um, by um, Israeli um, police officers. And we know now that the NSAR, some of those soldiers were trained by British mm. police. police. Yeah. So we see the same systems of violence playing out across the world and they're, they're all linked. And that, that took me back to that. So that was Ayobami. And uh, do remember if you have, whether you're here in the audience with us in the theater or listening online, please do submit any questions you have, any thoughts you have even um, via the line if you're online, there should be a, 
line underneath. I can't see the screen, so I'm not sure what it says underneath. <laughs> but please link. Or, um, as I said, if you're in the audience here, please do raise your hand and tell one of um, our um, sisters here um, about your question or, or pose it. And sorry, it's very, very remiss of me because I haven't done uh, three major in introductions as well. Rachel is our signer. Uh, and currently, it's not Rachel. It is another lady whose name... Eve? Vivi. Vivi. Vivi and Rachel will be um, our interpreters. They are doing British Sign Language um, for those of you um, who need uh, interpreting. And also, let me do proper introductions about for Chigadili and also for Inua. So do oh, forgive well, me. I was, you so, must. I was so excited <laughs> that, um, that I didn't actually tell you more about uh, our esteemed and honoured um, participants, panellists. So Chigadili um, is a Nigerian speculative fiction writer. Is that the right term to use? That's what people use. I just thought I was writing. What do I know? <laughs> yeah, because I, I wondered about that terminology too, but we'll hear more about um, Chigadili's writing. But one of the, the books that really put you on the map for some people, even though you've been writing for many years, is Dazzling, um, which won the inaugural Curtis Brown First Novel Prize. Um, and also, that was in 2019. But also, Chigadili has been short, was shortlisted for the Kane Prize for African Literature. Um, she's twice. Also, twice. <laughs> yes, sorry. Thank you for the correction. And she's also a former colleague because we used to work together for yeah. many years at yes. the BBC World Service. But her writing is just, I mean, it just transports you to another world. And I think that's why people call you a speculative fiction writer. And I had to look up that terminology because I always just thought that Chickadilly writes in a very magical way, taking you to a different realm. Um, but they say speculative fiction writing. How would you describe that? Um, I think it's just supposed to encompass everything else, really. I mean... Horror, bizarro fiction, weird fiction, science fiction, fantasy, fabulism, magical realism, okay. folklore, mythology, the whole works. Okay. Basically, if you like Marvel, uh, you won't like my work. <laughs> but, but it's in the same field. It's in the same field. My point is in the same field. Okay. Well, no, wait, you don't consider Marvel speculative fiction? No, no, it is. I didn't say that. I said it's in the same field. I don't know if... Magical. I don't know if... I mean, I, I, I think that um, a lot of what I write is not... I mean... Okay, so 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 Marvel is kudos to Marvel, but it's very much a Hollywood version of of the sort of Nordic folk tales that I read when I was growing up. So if I think what influenced me the most were all the original stuff. So not the Disney Marvel versions of things like Cinderella, where she's like, oh, princess, princess, but the other one, the proper grim one, where the stepsisters has to slice up their feet to get into the shoes. <laughs> that one was what influenced me. You know, and obviously, like in in the original um, Nordic tales, you know, Balder is the favorite son, not Thor. Mm -hmm. And what happens to Balder? Does anyone know? I'm talking to myself. No. What happened to Balder? <laughs> what happened to Balder? He 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 died. He pops up in the Marvel comics, by the way, but I know, but not in the same. Season. Exactly. We have yeah. to. We yeah. have to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, but you know what I mean. Like it's I know it's a lot of it is properly grim yes. and properly yeah. in keeping with real life. Real life is not all, you know, rainbows and sunshine. It is sometimes, but what makes you appreciate the rainbows and sunshine is all the hard, horror, disgusting, gory, evil stuff, and that's what I I write. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't have done a better introduction. And to my left is Inua Elams, who is an acclaimed poet, playwright, director. No. And you're also a graphic, you're a graphic artist as well? Yes. Okay. And you may know him, many of you, by the Barbershop Chronicles, mm -hmm. um, which I have to thank my daughter for, you know, forcing me, not forcing me actually, <laughs> persuading me to watch. Um, because I'd seen it and seen it advertised and had never, had never gone to see it yeah. until the lockdown. We mm. actually saw it and I was blown away. And I think many people were too. And now you can actually catch Inua um with an evening with an immigrant. Ye are you still touring? Or in America next year. There are no plans to do it here year. just yet. Okay. And he's also somebody that has also been involved in 
other things other than writing. I understand yeah, that you take people on walks at night. What's it called? Or you <laughs> used to? No, no, no. I kid you not. I, I did, kid no, you not. She's, she's absolutely correct. I just shrugged because there's a lot of other things that I do, and it would take too long to explain. But yeah, I do this midnight walks thing. But I don't even. I try. Do you bring them all people. back at the end? <laughs> 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 because you see, like if I took them, they would just be gone. <laughs> well, the reason it's interesting that you're saying that because I, uh, when I heard about these walks, and mm -hmm. it might come into our discussion later, I just wondered this is something you could never replicate in Nigeria. Exactly. And I just wonder if you can just give people a taste of what these walks are yeah. so that people can keep this in their mind so that later when we're talking about the state of Nigeria today, we can feed that into yeah. the discussion. I so tried to create one in Nigeria for this uh, yeah, just So it's called the Midnight Run, but we don't run. Now and then we do relay races, but we don't set out to run. It's called the Midnight Run, but we walk for most of the time. And, and, um, and I, I find routes through a city and I invite strangers to explore the roots with me. And I invite local artists to design workshops or artistic interventions during the course of the midnight run. It lasts from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., sometimes 12 hours from 6 p.m. to midnight. And we've done them in Australia, New Zealand, right across the UK, four or five in Italy, a couple in Rome, Spain, here and there. And it's just a great way to create a mobile village for duration of time. We spend most of the time playing and laughing and creating artwork, which we share for one night only for maybe between 25 to 30 minutes each artistic intervention, and then we just, we just move on. It's the greatest amount of fun I have each year. Mm. Yeah. I'm sure many didn't actually realize you did that too. Yeah. <laughs> that was a revelation to me. Yeah. But, um, Let's hear now one of our other readings, um, which is a pre-recorded reading. It's Uma Turaki, and this is Father's Land. A land where father is born. It is my land too. Father says so and teaches me so. With his choices and his living and his working, even with his dying. Father works for the land in a manner of saying so but also in a concrete sense, because Father works with concrete and the kind of things that go into concrete, sand, gravel. Father also knows a lot about the land. He knows about rocks and minerals and metals. He also knows the deep stuff like ores and tectonic plates and fault lines. There's a picture of him as a younger man in an underground mine. He's wearing heavy duty overalls and a yellow helmet with a headlight. I can't recall if he's holding a pickaxe or not, but it is an image that hurries forth whenever I think about father and his work. On a fishing trip once somewhere in Rayfield, back when it is just the back of town and not the swath of real estate that gouges you penniless if you don't take time. I see a hillside made of kaolin and stop to pick up a few lumps as a birthday gift for father, knowing he loves rocks. I am 10 years old. And our thanks to Uma Turaki for that reading. That was called Father's Land. And talking in, in very beautiful terms about our land, the actual soil, the, the ground. Mm. What, what did that conjure up for for you? Um, <laughs> the very first thing it made me think <coughs> about was, the f was my first artistic endeavor. I was four years old and I planned a city. This is when we lived in Jaws. And because I was four years old and a bit of an idiot and was probably beefing with my twin sister, I segregated the city. <laughs> so the guys were on one side and the girls were on the other. Oh. And it was all built on concrete foundations. And um, we had the swimming pools, the ice cream parlors, the Coca-Cola butter. What did the plants, women have? Uh, just grass. <laughs> Pretty much. So it made me think about that. And, and also he said a lot about my father. My father was really proud that his son had planned a city. So he folded it and put it in his briefcase and took it to work. We just felt like he was telling me to go forth and colonize <laughs> Nigeria. So it made me think about, yeah, just thinking about rocks and soil and me trying to invent and sculpt my own reality. I mean, it made me think, I wondered if his son, if his father rather worked in the oil industry mm -hmm. or the geologist or something like that. Yeah. For you, Chikudini? 
Man, I'm like, I don't even know if I need to answer these questions again because you know I'm going to go back to being Igbo again. That's fine. <laughs> you know, That's it's always about like, I'm Igbo and this is the thing. You know, land is so important to Igbo people. Mm. You know, how many Igbo people are here, first of all? Yeah. <laughs> Three is enough. Some there are four of us now. Sacred number. But <laughs> land is very, very important to Igbo people, not just for what it can bring forth, but also for what it symbolizes. And he uses my father's land a lot, you know, even in, I mean, it's funny that in Nigeria, right, we refer to Nigeria as a country as my fatherland. We don't say motherland like people say, oh, I'm going to my motherland. We say fatherland. And it's because Nigeria is such a patriarchal culture. And so with regards to land and my culture, land is not just about, like I said, what, you can, what it can give you, but also what it is. And what it symbolizes is continuity, lineage, connection and also um, sort of value. So if you don't have land, you, you really have nothing. You know, you could have seven sons, but what are you going to leave the sons when you're dead? If you don't have land, you might as well have only daughters. And I'm saying that with irony. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, you might as well only have daughters because what do daughters do? After all, they go away and they marry into other families. So if you have kids, if you have sons and you have no land, you're nobody. And that is why a lot of people, no matter what they achieve outside Nigeria, would always try to have, even if it's a little bit of land that is as small as this glass that you can put a finger on and be like, this is my land. You know, it's really important in that regard because the land is what makes you a person. If you don't have land, then you're not a person. My kids are from a place called Oka in Anambra State. And what a lot of people do in Oka is a child is not a child until they're two years old, right? Until then, the spirits can have them. And the spirits often do because some kids, as you know, don't live that long. Mm -hmm. You know, they would die from um, any manner of childhood diseases. And so um, the reason I'm using Oka as an example is that Oka is the one place in which women and men are treated the same. And so a person could come from Oka and go to my four-year-old and do the with her, like, like she's a man, you know? But they wouldn't do that with me because I was married into the place. And so what happens when they become two years old is they're each given a tree. You get a tree planted, a palm tree planted for you. And the tree is supposed to symbolize yourself, but then it's planted in the earth and that's supposed to symbolize that connection that you have to the earth. No matter what happens, this is who you are and this is where you come from. Mm. So that essay reminded me how similar we really are, mm. even when we don't think we are similar. Mm. Even when we think we are looking at the land as something else or as a different sort of thing to how we would normally see it, it's still that, it's still that connection that belonging that we're talking about. But also when you're also talking about how women are disenfranchised later on. Yes. That is such a, Don't a, get me a global, started. Yes. uniform thing. And not just yeah. in Nigeria. I mean, there are people I'm sure in the audience here in the theatre or even at home who are not from Nigeria who can also identify with the fact that women are robbed of their birthright as soon as they marry. Or even if or they you don't have marry, no birthright. Even if you don't marry, exactly. Yeah, they have no even birthright. Even if you don't marry, you are not given a portion of land. You are not regarded as a, as a full entity in yourself and have no right to inherit <coughs> inherit any land. Um, you know, and, and it also made me think of our, our, um, our national anthem. Um, you know, Nigeria, we hail thee our own dear native land. Yeah. So that's old the, one, you That's mean. the old yeah. one, sorry. <laughs> that dates me, so you wouldn't... Be, I'm in my 50s, so that dates me. I used to sing that, um, that uh, you know, national anthem when I was young, mm. you know, and it's now what, Arise, O Compatriots, Nigeria's Call, call Obey, you know, to serve <laughs> our fatherland. That's what I mean. With love yeah. and yeah. strength yeah. and faith. Yeah. You know, mm. I Nobody mean... Nobody's serving so the motherland. Exactly, yeah. we don't. Motherland. And, you know... Let me ask you, when you think about it, it's interesting that it took you back to you making this kind of... Um, mm -hmm. you, was it a utopian... I, I mean, it was utopian in the fact that you had the segregation. You wanted to be apart from your sister. I was four <laughs> but, years old. But, yeah. four. <laughs> yeah. but as you grew older, yeah. how did that vision of the land and the city that you wanted to create. Joss, I have to say, for those that don't know, Joss in, in Plateau State is central Nigeria. And I remember when I was growing up, they called it the Switzerland 
of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. It was the, you know, kind of be all and end all. If you couldn't go abroad, you wanted to go to jobs. Not not just because of the climate. The climate was kind of similar to Europe at some stages, especially during the Hamatan. But just the flora and fauna, what you would see, a place of beauty. Now, sadly, it's a place of discord. It's a place where university students are scared to go to the campus. It's, you know, as in replicated in other parts of Nigeria, not just because of sectarian conflict, but over land, we have battles for the very land, yeah. you know, that yeah. you have herders who are now conflicting with farmers who are now spilling blood over who owns the land. Yeah. And we have hundreds of thousands, millions across different parts of Nigeria. The, con- the nation is torn apart. So when you had this vision, mm-hmm. or if you still have this vision, what does it look like to you? It's, it's definitely changed. I remember um, there's this play I'm working on. I should start working on it tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a year late, but Corona, right? Um, <laughs> um, it's all set in the north of Nigeria. It's a, it begins in 1865 or so and ends in 1903. Um, and it's, it's about the last days of the Sokoto Empire. And I reached out to Nigerian, northern Nigerian academics saying, I want to come and meet all of you and discuss all of this thing. And they said, don't come. I said, why? They said, the roads are not safe. The land is not safe. They said, politicians were traveling via helicopter because they didn't want to encounter anyone from bandits to the extremists on the land itself. So the land, the land no longer holds the people. It's there are fault lines everywhere. And just as my hometown, you know, that's where I was born. And I haven't left, I haven't been there since maybe 93 or 94. Uh, so I really want to go, but my land is not, is hostile to me. It's a, it's a hostile environment. And like you said, um, the skirmishes between them is because not just of sectarian violence, but because of poverty, which is all linked to how the British divided the land when they were withdrawing, quote unquote, um, and given the country its independence, but their fault lines everywhere. I mean, some yeah. would also say that climate change also plays a part because yeah. when you have yeah. um, communities struggling over resources and with desertification and lack of uh, watering holes for the cattle, you then have the cattle rearers who are now, uh, you know, entering into farm uh, farmlands yeah. and that causes a conflict. But then again, what are our, our governments doing in order to prevent this happening? What protection are they giving to the indigenous communities? And then you have different states which are saying, well, okay, give a little grazing mm. land to these. I heard of the story about the very, the very early days of Boko Haram. And what happened was just exactly like you said, there was this watering hole somewhere in the north and they were camped around it. And they were mostly just like Muslim hippies, right? They had nothing to do with the Nigerian state. They wanted to avoid all of the wahala that governed the country. So just they were just camped there. But the Nigerian government wanted this watering hole. So they tried to bribe them and they said, ah, we're out here with deserts and camels. What are we going to do with money? No, thank you. So they then tried again. They refused. Then they got weapons and just killed a bunch of their ruling class and drove them away from the water and hold. So those Muslims traveled up through Nigeria to Chad. And that's when, um, um, what do you call them, um, ISIS got in contact with them okay. saying, I heard mm. you guys have been mistreated. Come, we'll treat you. We'll teach you how to treat them. And then gave them weapons and they came back and started their madness. But they weren't called Boko Haram until the CIA called them Boko Haram. And the phrase Boko Haram itself comes from Boko, <coughs> which was the script the British and the French tried to impose on the Northern Nigerians to get them to write everything in this in this French script. Though that's one theory. There that's are one of the other stories. analysts yeah. who would also Absolutely. differ quite yeah, distinctly yeah. from, from your and I just wonder, especially talking about the land and talking about cattle, it kind of brings me nicely, before we go to Jay Chukwu's reading, mm-hmm. to your reading, Inwa, if yeah. you can also give us the readings that oh, you yes. selected for. Um, so writing my essay wasn't difficult at all. I think it just poured out um, in a day or two. And it's because, one, I was writing I was writing this play, which meant that I was researching the North. And two, it's because I've, you know, I'm, I've, I grew up swimming through lakes of Suya. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was easy to sort of put pen to paper. And I'd, 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 there was a writer whose name escapes me now, but she tried to write about the different types of Suyas. 
So I reached out to her. And for those that don't know, I mean, my mouth is watering now just thinking yeah. about Suya. For those of you that haven't had your breakfast, I apologize. But for those of you who don't know what Suya is, and for those of you who are carnivores like me, it is, uh, it's, um, well, delicious heaven. meat. It's heaven. It is heaven. heaven. Um, and it's stick. delicious meat on a stick, which is dried, but particular spices. It's infused <laughs> with spices, both when it's roasting and also after it's finished. Yeah. I think in Kenya it is yeah, yeah, a bit like nyama choma, but it's a distinct, it's, it's another like word. Nama, it's not like no, nyama No, 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 but in the way, okay. <laughs> no. Are there any, are any, <laughs> Kenyan, <laughs> are there any Kenyans in the house? Okay. Oh, is, yes. Is is it, like have you ever like tasted suya? No, no, but you know in terms of the roasting, that's, that's as far as the, the resemblance <laughs> goes. But the taste of, of suya is just out of this world. So apologies to all you vegetarians or vegans in the like house. Saying, I know one or two. Are the same but um, <laughs> this reading by Inua read centers on minutes. Suya is at the crux. Of <laughs> okay, five minutes, right. So I'll stop. Right. A brief history of Suya. It began this way. A long time ago in the land before the country, on an afternoon in which the sun stood static and thankless in the sky, it grew angry. Such was its fury at that thanklessness that it stuffed the breeze back down the gullets of wind tunnels, roared at crippled remnants of rain, boiled the breath of the land to a slow ooze of air, and maintained a steady and solid beating down on the desert ground. Such was its fervor that the scorpions found it too unbearable to move, Mere cats had altogether stopped playing, the ostriches had shrugged off their feathers, and all the cacti had shriveled up, camels had gone on strike, beaching themselves on the shores of dunes, and even the snakes had shed down to their thinnest skins. In a nearby cave, two thieves, hiding from the traveling to our eggs they had stolen from, were baking in the thick, voiceless dark, famished and desperately parched. They waited for dusk to settle, then crept out with their dry lips cracked and thin rivulets of blood seeping like tiny springs. They licked these wounds, hissing at the sharp pain, their tongues like sandpaper. Across the dunes, they could see an encampment, an archipelago of campfires where flames flickered like dancing beacons. They could hear the lull of a lute, a reed of pipes floating lilt, and a kettle drum mingling with laughter and dancing feet. They moved to satiate their hunger, creeping close and closer, their bodies never more than an inch off the shifting sands, their eyes like four low-lying moons, luminous in the night. One had a stone knife, its obsidian blade tucked into an antelope bone handle, the other a length of rope woven from palm fronds, tools for the nefarious trade. They slid past the kitchen quarters, the cleric's sprawling tent, the courtesan's caravans, and came to the clearing that held the cattle. There, they rose to their feet and stared. Should I keep going? My earliest memory of storytelling also happened at night, centuries after these thieves, decades after the land had become the country, and thousands of miles further south in the breakneck speedy city of Lagos. By then, the country had wrestled itself away from those who had invented it had survived the civil war, begun to trade in oil, preserved through several coups, and from these close shaves with destruction and, desert and desertion, had spun new stories of ingenuity and resilience in the face of impossible odds. These thematic strands were woven into the fabric of the Nigerian spirit, and that night, my father and his friends were deep in its folds. They had gathered in the living room of our house in Ibutemeta, and they had been talking for hours. They had drunk enough beer to sink a dwarf whale. And, could, and you could tell by how richly they laughed at thin jokes, how completely they emptied themselves of all reservations, cackling into the briefest silences or cascading with thunderous joys, that they were completely at ease in their company, that they could end and begin each other's sentences, that they were that close, so intimately known to each other. On the table before them was a mountain of suya, and around them, fist-sized newspaper parcels of extra red pepper, ground nuts, and thinly sliced raw onions. The mountain of meat was ever rest to me, and I wanted to eat its summit. My eyes were leveled at its topmost slice, the aroma moving my mouth to water. My father, knowing his son, warned, this boy, you didn't learn from your lesson from last time, eh? And the friends erupted into laughter. Like father, like son, one chimed, and the bouts of laughter strengthened anew. The thieves were, should I stop? 
Not powerful. Okay. The thieves were a perfect duo. The knife wielder are cunning and the rope bearer are strong. Among the cattle, they stood far apart and opposite each other with their arms spread out and walked forward, getting closer and closer until they had cornered a small goat. The rope bearer swiftly bound its mouth to keep it from bleating, then its legs, and the knife bearer slid a thin wooden pole th he th a thin wooden pole he'd broken from the fence under the nuts. They found the trough filled with water for the cattle, gulped down as much as they could, and crawled back to the bound up animal. They crouched down, lifted one end of the rope on, onto a shoulder each, and looked around to ensure no job obsessed goat herd, wandering guests, no young couple, a drunken reveler, no one was tottering towards them, then rose up and fled back across the dunes, the night eating up the dust raised by their feet. Thank you very much, Inua. So <laughs> okay. Tell us about the inspiration. Was it just dreaming about Suya? I mean, w was it a gift when, you know, Nancy and... Yeah. Or I said that you could write something that you thought, okay, here's my time. So um, in, in the essay, I, re I refer to uh, my father telling me, this boy, you didn't learn from last time. And there was this incident where a similar thing, my father and his friends were eating Suya. And, uh, and I fought to take a piece and then my father let me and I was there trying to bite and the meat slipped through my fingers and hit my face. It was <laughs> very elastic. It was probably, um, what do you call it? The tendons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I cried. I cried for about two days. Because solidly. of the pepper. Because of the pepper. Because of the pepper. So that was, that. the pain of that is still in my bones, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to, I've always wanted to do something with that. So thinking about Suya, so thinking about the con, the, the con, the creation of those spaces and my father and friends would sit down. I just wanted to talk about, the, yeah, I wanted to sort of reveal of that in something. Yeah. And, and that's the beauty of this, of this book, I think, of, of this Our Country, is that it has, it's such a, a mix of different emotions, different memories, you know, and you know yours also took you back to your childhood, which we'll hear a bit later, you know, and, and a lot of the writers, it's the same, but some it's just thoughts about the present mm. as well as the past. It's thoughts about joys of, you know, being in Nigeria. Some it's of a Nigeria that they can imagine because not all the writers have lived or grown up mm -hmm. in Nigeria. Um, and it's just, please remember, I mean, one, um, especially if you're here in the theatre, um, the book of This Our Country is available um, in the foyer later, and there'll be a signing later on for any of you that want to buy it. Um, but also, please, 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 if you have any questions that are prompted by any of the readings, either by our two lovely authors on the, on the stage or any of the authors whose readings you've heard, please do remember to send any questions and post them, either raising your hand or if you're at home and you're listening, please do put your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom. Now, though, we'll have the reading by J.K. Chukwu, and hers is Against Enough. <laughs> Against Enough by J.K. Chukwu, a very powerful but quite abstract also um, mm. reading. What did that conjure for you? Because, uh, and if I can read a little bit also from um, before coming to you, Chigadili, she said, as I mourn the lives and hopes lost from the BLM protests and the Lekki massacres, I unravel. As I wait for the next act of violence from white terrorists and debate whether Trump who rots with hatred, whose murderous hands are dyed red from his ignorance, in truth is the most American president since Andrew Jackson, hmm. I unravel, I unravel, I unravel. And this clearly, you know, written during the time, uh, 2020 was such a, an emotive time for so many of us on so many levels. And it brought for JK so many issues too to the fore. When you heard her reading, did that conjure up similar thoughts for you? Um, yeah, because I'd, I mean, I'd read the essay and I think for me, it's, it, again, it's, it's the similarity. You know, we were all going through the same things, it seemed, but... I mean, we've always gone through the same things all around the world, but this time it was, it was brought home by the pandemic. We all had to be at home at one level or another. And so we were all not distracted. There was that ability to connect fully, sometimes a bit too much because you had nothing but time. And so I think what happened was it, it brought a lot of people an awareness of 
themselves, yes, because you have nobody at the end of the day but yourself to face. And a lot of people spent their pandemic lockdowns mm-hmm. alone, mm-hmm. you know. But also, it made you more aware of how much people were just like you and were going through the same things that you were going through. There was just an awareness. And for a lot of people, a lot of mental breakdown as well. Mm. Because with that awareness came the sense of powerlessness, the, uh, the, I, the, the knowledge that there was only so much you could do. You know? And so for me, it all tied up to you know, NSARS protests in Nigeria, the BLM protests in America, still ongoing. The, the right-wing movement sweeping the whole of Europe. And then there's the madness of Brexit. You know, there was a lot of trauma last year. And I think that the fact that there are a lot of Nigerians in all these places mm-hmm. made it also a Nigerian problem. Mm-hmm. Because we couldn't then do the thing which a lot of Nigerians do, which is when things are bad in Nigeria, like, oh, well, at least I have a British passport. No, no, Britain was burning too. America was burning too. Where are you in Europe? It's burning too. So we had to pay attention, and we, we're still having to pay attention because it's no longer a matter of it's all the way back there. It's happening in Nigeria. It's happening here too. There's no, oh, it's hot here. I'm going to run back to Nigeria. In fact, our parents are telling us not to come back. Like Inua said, you know, I said to my folks, I'm going to come back with the kids and I need them to do one year. They said, come back to where? Where do you want to come back to? There's fire everywhere. So it's stay and, and build or stay and bank up, bank up your shores and try and bank, keep the, fl- the flames at bay mm-hmm. because there's nowhere to run to. We're all going through the same things. And, and it's interesting, as you say, how everything kind of conflated and just hearing, and you can imagine how people would unravel when they were by themselves. Mm. You know, how do you deal with this? If, for instance, the Black Lives Matter protest started, but you were worried about COVID, you wanted, perhaps, you, you had debated with yourself, should I go out and protest, shouldn't I? Do I want to go out and protest? Do I believe in it? Mm. But even if I do, can I go because of COVID? Mm. I'm worried about COVID. It's the same as with NSARS. People were worried, but I heard cousins and others saying, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm going out, or, and then others saying, don't go out, you know, yeah. either because they didn't believe in NSARS or because they were afraid of COVID, though there wasn't as much of the worry here. For you, did you did you understand the unraveling, the, the talking yeah, about the unraveling? Definitely. And in the in the in the last sentence she talks about um song, she talks about singing and she talks about the Civil War. And it was something that we ca- we played a lot of attention to when we were working on Three Sisters, which was my last play at the National Theatre about the Civil War. And and we we flew in the last cast member was a singer, um, um, an Igbo songstress and poet, who we flew in from Nigeria to do that specifically. And each night, she improvised each song that, that she performed, which was the bridge between all the acts. And we wanted to keep a live element of, of, of the story, something that we couldn't curate, that we couldn't try and 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 invent or or, or or steer too much. We just created space for her to be herself. So, and each night she would do that. She'd listen to the play, she'd try and get the feel of the audience mm-hmm. and improvise a poem specifically. So no two shows were the same specifically for her, but also for each show in that very simple literal level. But um, the use of song in, 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 in the play to transport the lift was really, 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 really poignant. And it was the same thing when I was researching that I discovered just how many choirs and acts were, despite the intense, consistent destruction and attacks by the Nigerian government at the time, just the, the importance of song. Yeah, that just came back to me in her, in her reading. Yeah, And celebration, because it was the birthday. Mm. And that is how three sisters mm. begin with, with, with the birthday. And it's interesting as well, when you're talking about song, you know, during this period, especially during 2020, when... Um, uh, Nancy and or I thought about this whole idea. This is when so many people maybe reverted to song, especially if you're mm. by yourself or even if you're with family. And I, I certainly did. Music helped so many of us, you know, and so many people I know may have even had a playlist for, you know, during that period, you know, whether it's for the pandemic or whether it's for Black Lives Matter or whether it's for NSARS and the role that musicians also played mm-hmm. and was so important. Please, 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 can I please remind you if you have a question that you want to pose and, and don't feel that the questions have to be after the discussion. If any of you have any questions now that you feel like 
putting to either of the authors, please do just raise your hand and one of our lovely sisters will come round with a microphone. So if any of you are prompted to, to ask a question, please feel free right now. I'm sure they'll be happy um, to answer. Oh, and a gentleman already does. Thank you. And you can say your name if you want to. Exactly. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Billy Kahora. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, incredible discussion. Um, when I think I, I'm, I'm a Kenyan writer, and when and, and I, I I write a lot about political events, um, and and I mean they're just so many, right? Mm -hmm. And they're just so big. Um, and and when I try and kind of either novelize or kind of impose any form of creative writing on a political event, my struggles always like. What is it that you take? Hmm. How much of it do you take? What do you select? What do you omit? Um, how do you fit those so-called real life political events into the form that you've chosen? Mm. So I just really wanted to hear about your process, how you choose what, what events to take on, what part of them, how do you fit them into whether it's a novel or a play or a poem and and, and yeah just just process thanks who wants to take that first you know uh, chikadu. Chikadu. <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't sure because you didn't you didn't look as if you wanted to speak please, please. um <clears throat> it's just i'm tired of hearing my own voice and i'm i'm just recovering from a <laughs> i'm recovering from a cold and so i'm oh, okay. trying to give the old voice box a, a rest because i can can hear it going sexy you know <laughs> um I think that a lot of the time, this is, this is true for me, I don't know about anybody else, but when you're writing characters in a particular setting at a particular time, given that the whole of Nigeria is one big conflict, it's just easy to choose the conflict that is happening at the time. And there's always something. Sometimes it's local, sometimes it's, it's you know, according to ethnic group, and sometimes it's, it's natural, and sometimes it's all three at once. And so I think for me, personally, I tend to make it small. It's an old journalism trick, you know, to focus on the smallest element of a massive conflict, conflict as a way of making people care about that conflict. Because if you were to broaden it out, then it's, you're talking a lot of numbers and it's very hard to relate. If they tell you 52,000 people died from COVID in Britain last week, you're like, oh. If they say to you, there was a three-year-old boy who died from COVID and in the middle of his funeral, 20 family members caught COVID and out of that, his mother, his father, his brother and his dog died. You care more about that because it's one three-year-old boy and it's one family and you're looking at the people within that family versus 52,000 people. We're not saying that 52,000 people are not important or that this one boy whom I'm calling Billy now, sorry, Billy, whom I'm calling Billy now is, 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 has got COVID, that he's more important, but it's easier to humanize the conflict when you're looking at it through the lens of one person or a small group of people. So I tend to kind of like bring it down to smaller groups of people and that's how i i select what i put in um i have yeah similar ways of working but i'm but i'm maybe a little bit more pedantic than that um so i have a workshop on creative writing specifically to do with theater which i teach a lot it's called volatile space and what i do is i invite all my students to pick um, a big ass topic one of the you know massive things happening in the world climate change um, at whatever, and then I tell them to make a list of 10 places that engage with this theme, from the most obvious to the most ridiculous, from the most um, concrete to the most abstract. So you, you can imagine, it could start from, say, for instance, Black Lives Matter, maybe the streets of London, to a filing cabinet inside the Houses of Parliament, to um, the factory where they make the pens that, they, that are in those filing cabinets, to maybe you know somewhere where they, they mine the, the rubber which is used to make the cap for the pen. And I ask them, OK, so imagine there are two individuals who work in that farm. How are they related to Black Lives Matter? How far are they? Does it, does it, you know, and that's who I try to write about. 
So I try to go far. And sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes it does, but you have 10 potential, potential locations and individuals in those locations who, ha who, who interact with the topic, and that's how I do it. So like Chikadili said, going head on just doesn't really work, but going distance from it and lateral can create really interesting narratives and points of view. And also just one thing to bear in mind was that not all the essays, interestingly, a lot did focus on the state of the nation or historical or, or future kind of uh, feel, feelings and tensions, but not all of it. The, you were asked, your brief was to just talk about Nigeria and what it... I wanted to talk about meant, the hopeful and exactly like the hopeful bits of Nigeria, because you have to remember this was commissioned during one of the bleakest periods in Nigeria's history of recent. So we're, we're hoping to bring some hope back to what we thought of Nigeria, what we remembered of our childhood in Nigeria. Suya, for instance. I mean, we all like Suya. You know, you tell people you're vegetarian, they're like, okay, do you want chicken instead? You know, that kind of thing. So it's just, it's just, you know, looking for those little moments of light within the darkness, you know, because even like a small little ray of light can pierce so much. And for me, it was like holding up a blankie full of holes and just having the sunlight stream through. That's what we're asked to do. In the end, the sunlight will overcome the massive blanket that is blocking out most of the sorry, blocking out most of the sun. And so I, I, that's how I visualize the brief. And so I chose a moment, you know, that's what we're hoping to do, to choose moments where even though there might be conflict in the essays, the overarching feeling is one of positivity and hope. And not all, and not everybody was talking about politics and no, politics. No, no, no. So just, just don't feel that this book was all just about politics. But I see there's somebody else. And just to tell you, we do have another um, reading, another reading. But before then, um, we can have this lady's question, please. Okay, I'll be really quick. Um, thank you for a really interesting conversation. I could listen to you guys talk all afternoon. Um, my name is Aboyo, and I'm a Nigerian, but very much a southern Nigerian. Both my mum and dad are from Delta State. And I think when I read books by Nigerian authors, what seems to be a recurring theme that I see is a lot of representation from the south of Nigeria. And I guess there's a little bit of an issue around like the, what's the name of that TED talk? The, the problem with a single story, mm -hmm. where all I hear about the north is conflict and Boko Haram. And I guess I wondered, I wanted to guess hear your opinion on how we could amplify the voices of writers from northern Nigeria, because I feel like we've heard a range, we know a range of authors from the south of Nigeria, we know lots of perspectives, but not that many from the north. If you knew, or if you had any thoughts on the topic, I mean, you. I can't speak for um, Ore or for Nancy, but just to say that in this book, they, I think they have tried to get a spread you know, so not Nancy can speak for Nancy. Oh, Nancy is over there. I wondered. That's Nancy. I she can speak for Nancy. I was seeing you. Yeah, there we go. I wondered why. Give her the microphone. Yeah. Please, Give her the microphone. She can answer can, this question. Please, can she? No, no, no. Please, can you? <coughs> no, 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 no. It's a question. Nice this is try. your baby. Nice try. It's a question can you can answer. Hi, everyone. Um, <coughs> so I would say we were very intentional in terms of even as editors, we were very aware of who we were. So I'm from Anambra State, um, or as a Yoruba woman. So what we didn't want necessarily is when we're speaking about Nigeria to just focus on our perspectives of, of Nigeria. So even when we were listing all the authors, we were very aware of what part of Nigeria they represent, right? So we, in terms of diversity of voices, that was something that we absolutely um, considered when we were kind of putting the collection together. Um, I, I don't know, in terms of people who've read the book, what you thought about the diversity, but one thing that I loved, particularly I would say maybe Umar's essay, is as a Nigerian, I realized that there's so much of a Nigeria that I had never, mm -hmm. like there are languages that I had never heard about before. Um, and I think that's one of the most moving things for me reading the essays is to see how much as a Nigerian I can learn from the North, from different parts of Nigeria. So that was something that was really important to us. I hope it's reflected in the book. Um, but yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> 
Most definitely is. And, uh, you know, thank you, Chikidili, for pointing out. Because I did she think at one stage... She was hoping to get away with it. She was like, something. I'm just going to into my at chair. At one stage, I said something which was representative of the authors. And I kind of saw Nancy and I thought, is it Nancy or is it Nancy? Yes, you know, it is Nancy. Nancy. So forgive me. <laughs> but thank you very much for answering the question. Um, but I, I do think you did represent, you know, I certainly have got that sense. And I think also it has to be said, it isn't just a, a political... It's not just a polemic. Mm -hmm. It's not just people standing, you know, on their soapboxes, you know, saying what they think about the state of the nation and how it can be rectified. I think it's a celebration of Nigerianness or what we think about the nation and our thoughts and our dreams, not mine, the mm -hmm. author's thoughts and dreams. So let's hear another, if we can. This is now Chigozie Obioma, and the reading is um, Pride and Punishment. At the airport in Lagos, I felt my pride crescendo, feeling impressed by the edifice my beleaguered country had, despite its youth. It only got its independence in 1960, and its infant democracy, it's only been a democratic state since 1999, provided. The light shone in my face, and cheerfully I gave the airport workers money, waved at my dad and siblings. And when the plane ascended, I fixed my eyes on the window, wiping and reframing my gaze at the land disappearing into the amorphous darkness in the distance. Then, as the plane entered the planetary darkness of clouds, I started to weep. It took two days of opening my eyes into the daylight reality of the new country for the first internal shift about Nigeria to occur. It had been minuscule, as if the change had happened behind some invisible subconscious curtain, and its appearance now at the shop window of my mind surprised me. That day, I noticed that most of my friends had said to me that my speech had started to end with the phrase, I am disappointed. I had just uttered this word in reaction to the fact that electricity was constant in Lefkosha, the capital of the Turkish North Republic of Northern Cyprus. It had surprised me to find that a country so small with landscape so dry and under international embargo could have such reli reliable infrastructure when Nigeria did not. Then when I went into the city itself, I was confronted by the cleanliness of the streets and again I uttered those words and so I became disenchanted. But I had so much I struggled to sleep. My settling into the country was going well but I had I could not take my eyes off what was happening here. I found that increasingly, as I discovered more of Northern Cyprus, I came to see it, in it, everything my own country lacked. And the accretion of these deficiencies in time came to compose in me a tower of afflictive rage. Fight and punishment by Chigozie Obioma. And um, it's quite powerful because he starts by recounting the 1966 coup. Mm -hmm. And at one stage, he said when, he, um, when there was a national address afterwards and why the soldiers uh, mounted that coup, he said of that speech, all of which was transcribed in the newspaper, I still remember this line. We promised you that... We promise that you, the citizens, will no more be ashamed to say that you are a Nigerian. <laughs> and yet here we then hear how many decades later when she goes here, and he was actually in northern Cyprus, and he just couldn't understand why Nigeria, after how many years of, um, of independence and talking about us as the, you know, the how do we describe ourselves in terms of South Africa with that uh, competition that we always have? Mm. Um, Nigeria is seen as the bigger, more developed of the state. You know, we are the um, the giant of Africa. Giant That's of the Africa. term. 
the giant of Africa that can't produce constant electricity for the citizens, mm -hmm. the giant of Africa that doesn't have uh, free education or even education at a particular level for their citizens, the giant of Africa that can't protect citizens from even from armed robbers. Let's not even go to Boko Haram, mm. you know. And here he was in northern Cyprus saying, "Ah, oh, but hold on a minute. How come they can do it in this tiny nation and we can't do it?" So, hearing what Chigozie said, what did it make me think? Did it make you think, or is it something that you've well, heard all the time? I mean, he says that Nigeria has only been democratic since truly democratic since 1999, um, and for me. That's, that's the answer, right? If you think about this country, they've had centuries of democracy. Of, of we've been wedded into the consciousness of the people, quote unquote democracy, because as you know, there are caveats within that, you know. But for centuries and centuries, and it's still a new technology in, in Nigeria. And I think, so when it, when it disc discusses as a failed state, I think by which measure and stick, by what is, you know, how, and I think we'll get it right to just take some time. Unfortunately, the hundreds of thousands of people dying because of how much time it's taken and how much bloodshed, et cetera. But we'll get there in the end. For me, it's, it's, it's time. And it's interesting that you say democracy or that independence or democracy, you say, started in 1999, mm -hmm. not in 1960 when we gained independence. No, it was just So conflict. you feel that that was just... Yeah. A, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, I still think we're the giant of Africa. I mean, I don't <laughs> care what anyone says. Especially there are more of South us Africans. than there are more of us than there are of anybody else. <laughs> By that standard alone, we're the giants of Africa. I mean, look at any of the. This is an example. Look at any of the literary competitions. If there are ten people, eight of them are Nigerian. Do that what you will. You know, <laughs> it might be just a matter of numbers, as in there are more of us. But duh, that's the whole point. I think that, I think that, like Inwa says. We, we're only just starting, you know, and we're going from a system that was mostly, let's face it, it's, it's patrimonial politics, mm -hmm. you know. We're, we're trying to tell people that the way that we have always worked, where we dobale for, like, the, the eldest person, you know, we, so we kind of... Genuflect. We, exactly. Genuflect for the oldest person, and they're the authority by virtue of being the oldest person... We're trying to tell people now that that's not how it's supposed to work. That just because you're old doesn't mean you're the, the best person for the job, which is what we find in other, in other countries. And it's a really difficult thing to, it's a really difficult mindset to shift because we grew up with it, our parents grew up with it, their parents grew up with it, and going back, it's only these Gen Z people that want to burn things. <laughs> For no reason. You know, they just want anything. to burn things, you know? Yeah, oh, but, but, but hold on a minute. The Gen Z will say that they are the ones taking action. I agree. People That's of my I mean. generation, they I will agree. say, we're well, Yeah, I agree, I agree. I See, my generation, we're the millennials. Everybody just wants to pick on us. They hate us because they're like, oh, you're very, very complacent. And then when we do like, oh, you're doing. You know, these Gen Z people, I believe that it's now that we're going to start to see changes because they just came out like agents of chaos from the womb, you know, <laughs> matches in one hand, <laughs> kerosene in the other hand, and like we want to burn shit now, you know. <laughs> so I think that it's gonna take some time, but already the time is nigh, you know, mm. we're seeing it now. And unfortunately, what our generation avoided, which was we avoided conflict because we were largely browbeaten by our parents in every sense of the mm. word, is what they are not taking. You know, mm. when, when you, the examples are there for you to see. When we talk about queer Nigerians now being vocal, we had queer Nigerians when I was growing up, when but I was 10. Was we knew all of them. You know, we were, we were all like friends with them, the ones that were, you know, that were even the trans, a lot of trans um, people in our boarding mm -hmm. schools. We knew them. Mm. The authorities knew them, but they had to be underground because... Nobody wanted you to kind of like make noise, and they didn't want to make noise either. Mm. Versus the Gen Z queers that we see now, which is you must acknowledge my existence, and yes, mm. why not? So I will own my millennial hood of being respectful and polite in society, but I will also buy kerosene for any of the Gen Z people <laughs> to burn shit because we didn't we didn't make it work. We couldn't make it work. It's very hard to make it work when you're within that system. It's hard to dismantle things when you've been raised within that system. And it's not a physical thing, it's a mindset yeah. thing. I'm only really just beginning now to be more like this.
you know, whereas before I'd be like, oh, auntie, good afternoon. But it has to be you said, know? not every Gen Z or millennial and not every Gen Z wants to burn everything obviously, down either. Obviously, obviously, you know, yeah, it, it is also a case of that phrase that you used, which I quite liked, within reach of hope. Yes. People felt, well, and even felt that maybe Enzals was within reach of hope. If I can just read a, a quick mm -hmm. question here from somebody called Trish. Thank you very much, Trish. She sent this question online. She said, sorry, I couldn't be there today. I would really like to buy the book. Is it available to buy online somewhere? Thank you. And just to remind you, if you're here in the theatre, you can buy it outside in the foyer. But Trish, uh, sorry, Nancy, how can people buy um, the book if they want to, seeing as you're here? Everywhere. Please answer Trish's <laughs> question. It's available online, so from bookshop.org. Oh, sorry, the mic oh, is coming. Okay, it's available online, so from bookshop.org. Um, you can support um, independent booksellers, but it's also available on Amazon as well. Thank you very much. If you want to support an evil corporate. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it takes all sorts. Listen, we're not, we don't discriminate. <laughs> and um, also, if you're here, um, and especially if you're staying for the events later on today, um, we have, you know, the fantastic Mona El Tawi later um, here at the British Library. There's also food in between. So it's an all-day event, but there's um, Senegalese um, caterers who are also providing food there uh, in the courtyard. Uh, Little Baobab is the name of the restaurant. Um, so you can grab lunch before 2.30. Um, yeah, so, or, yes, before the 2.30 discussion, which is wild imperfections that some of you may be also be attending. So any other questions from here in the, in the hall? This gentleman here. And please remember, you can introduce yourself. Hello. Um, yeah, it's been really fascinating. Um, I've, I've read the book. I've, I've been asked to come along here by Brittle Paper, who you've probably heard about. So I'm going to be doing a write-up for them. Um, there's very, obviously very strong connections with Nigeria there. Um, I, from reading the book, to me, I've kept picking up on the contrasts and the hope, but also the disappointment and the, the self-criticism, but also throughout the book for me also there is incredible condemnation of the british and and colonialism which i fully understand um my i guess my question is what kind of model might you see for nigeria you talk about nigeria as a young country but certainly britain now can't be a model because we have corruption too we have problems with class divide wealth disparity um, so if you're a young country, what are you aiming to get towards? Because Britain certainly hasn't got it right now, just as we didn't have it right in the past. Thank you very much for that Good question. question. Um, <coughs> this, is the, this is simply what I was going to add to what you were saying about buying kerosene <laughs> um, for the Gen Z generation. I think, I think it, 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 it can only survive... It can only come from deeper conversation and trying to figure out a way to actually talk to each other. Because what, what you said, for instance, about the generational politics is, is, is a real issue, but there were elements of that which were so glorious and served us for centuries. You know, when you knew the roles you played in a community and it was demarcated by how old you were. There were certain responsibilities you took on in the village. And that worked for cent you know, until all of it was destroyed and those socialist structures were eradicated and replaced with capitalism and, and, patri and deeper patriarchal, patriarchal ones linked to money, which you know, just <coughs> turned everything. So for me, we can find a third path or something that works, that, that serves both. I don't know what it is yet. I'm not a politician. I think I'm it's led by women. Absolutely. I think it definitely is led by women. Yeah. This is exactly the play that I'm writing, which is set in the North. It, anyway, yeah, carry on. I think it's led by women. I yeah, I think agree. it's led by women. I think that what's missing is, in what you're talking about, is the an arena for women. Mm -hmm. You know, because if everybody carried their own weight, then the job would be easier. But what it is now is we've had a system that's coming. Like, I, I remember reading... <clears throat> Sorry, all these Victorian things I used to read when I was little, because I read a lot, my gosh. And it was always, the women would come in with their clothes, and <laughs> they had to be accomplished. And what was accomplished? You had to play an instrument. You had to be able to hold um, decent, conf decent conversation. You had to be, um, what's the other one? You had to speak more than English, so you had to speak uh, another language. Um, and they would have like these cards where, you know, they had the, the purse thing with the bag, and you'd have the cards. 
way of acceptable conversation, you know, what you could talk about and like you had to be beautiful or at least well put together and you had to be charming and laugh. <laughs> I suppose, ah, you know, all that stuff. And what it did was the missionaries took that and put that on our women. Mm-hmm. Whereas we had women that would take a machete and cut off mm-hmm. oh, Queen Amina, you know, if you went back Absolutely. centuries, you know, and then. so it was. It's the idea of womanhood that has changed, and with it, the role of womanhood. Yeah. So we now have a system. <coughs> Sorry, see why I didn't want some to water. <laughs> <laughs> so we now have a system that has tied our women up in these laces that they didn't come with before. So whereas we had women and their own avenue, so they would say, for instance, like Mm -hmm. I remember saying to my, like we still joke about it in my family, if my brother, I only have one brother, right? So we know he's going to inherit everything. And so anytime he wants to act like a, like a brother and be like, we say to him, yeah, but we can say we're not going to, we're not accepting your bride and you can't do anything. Mm. We can say, Lila, this wedding is not happening or you'll die. You know, and so it's that or you die that we are missing. We don't have women mm-hmm. in a lot of our political structures. And so the power and the might and the experience, because it's a different sphere. It's a different way of doing things. But it, we is don't it, have is it, that. Is it that we don't have the women? I think we do have the women. It's just that they're not given the they're space. Look at Dr. Yes. Obi yes. busily. Look at Queen Amina going yes. back into our into our history. Even <coughs> I'm thinking in my generation, when you're talking about you as millennial, I remember my peers were the ones who were here, um, who set up Radio Kudirat after you know the the um, the. MK Abiola's wife, who was assassinated in the 1990s. Women were at the forefront mm-hmm. of the pro-democracy movement. It's always the systems that have come, and as you say, they inherited from the colonial uh, regime, but the systems which have always managed to quieten these women. Yeah, and and also the society well structure that mm-hmm. we still have that... Um, the way that we attack women, and I say we because even women are sometimes those who attack other women who are standing, yeah. mm-hmm. wanting to stand. When you just talk about the abuse that some of our women receive, when they stand uh, to be MPs, to be councillors, to be senators, and that form of, uh, you know, it's just unbelievable how even in 2021 it still happens, even with the Gen Z uh, generation. Yeah, but I that's because the mention- systems are not geared towards supporting the way that women lead. Not rule, because that's not what we do, you know. A lot of women <clears throat> are leaders, natural leaders. And so the system doesn't support that, that kind of leadership. You know, it's basically, we're fitting a lot of people in who are wartime rulers. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. they don't know what to do in peacetime mm-hmm. apart from war. Mm-hmm. We can't put them in there and expect them to, to lead. You know, I'd love to. I was just going to. Uh, we just have five more minutes. So if okay. anybody has a question for the audience, reading. please. Oh, yeah, yeah, you have I know. Reading. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. That's true. So before what? we have another question, can we quickly have Chigadili's? Yes. Yes. I, <laughs> do, I do apologize. Came all the way from and everybody, classes. please, please remember what question you want to pose. Hopefully, I wonder if the organizers can give us maybe five minutes more because this is a wonderful book that has so many issues that we want to discuss. And it would be a shame if. So um, please, could you give us five more minutes, Marcel? (laughs) Okay, my essay is called Life is a Marketplace. The language of the market was not always verbal, and its minefields confounded me. I know how to speak Igbo, but the expressions of the marketplace were self-assured, confident, adult, and rapid. There was a dance of how much and eh, how much? The theater that is pretending to walk off, the dramatic pleading to stay, both seller and buyer matching step for step. Come now, Auntie Small thing, you're vexing. And fine, haggle with me then, followed by fast mental maths, working out what increment in price stops short of insulting both goods and trader, feeling with hands, reading your rival's every expression, a suppressed sigh or dan- a suppressed hiss or sigh, a downturned mouth, how chatty or taciturn. Was your face bad for market or was it just how they did? An overly, ex- an overly cheerful expression could disclose a trader's disposition or could conceal faulty wares, the desire to offload quickly. Finally, how much last price? Before everything is settled, still watching the hands to make sure there's no last minute switch, 
no dented measuring cup, and the money is exchanged, examined for wear and tear before it goes in its place, mainly at the end of a wrapper tucked into the waist, onto the next. The aim of the interaction for both parties, however, is not just the one contact, but repeat custom. In the markets, the ideal trader and the buyer are treated equally to the ultimate endearment of customer. Goods are gendered. Men sell food crops like yam and cassava tubers, portions of beef, bloody and buzzing with flies, livestock, leather goods, frozen fish and hawks of iced bird parts like turkey thighs and chicken drumsticks. Women do dried fish and crayfish, grains and legumes, stew and soup ingredients like tatashi, onions, vegetables and cooking oils. One will be forgiven for assuming that women will be in charge of beauty products, but their jurisdiction in beauty is mostly limited to baby soaps and lotions, clothing and accessories. Men surprisingly own the beauty and jewelry sections. All genders are responsible for rolls of cloth, but once it becomes contemporary clothing like denim trousers, t-shirts and handbags favored by the young adults and university students, the arrow points towards the men folk again. Secondhand clothing and lingerie, women. My dislike for markets was not helped by the fact that we rarely visited the fun parts, the baking supply shops, where my schoolmates said one could earn pinches of raisins from shopkeepers for greeting properly, keeping shtum and not fidgeting so they could try to take most of our mother's money. Unless there was a special occasion, shopping with my mother or Biageli comprised bulk buys and uniforms, stockfish, tomatoes for blending and boiling down into crimson pastes, ready to magic into stew checkered blue cloth by the yard and white socks, retailed by women who bore their children's names as their own, prefixed proudly by the mama title. At Christmas, my mother might visit the ready-made quarters with shiny man-made fabric and netting conjured into puffy dresses with matching wrist bags or cosmetics, suffused with perfumed mists and floral chemical scents. The shops are packed manned by beautiful bleached boys with guy names like Edu Brazil and Chisco and Inno, short for innocent. As a child, I wondered why this, the holiest of female holies, remained the domain of fine boys. Life is a marketplace, and I love the way you portrayed those uh, market women because that just took me back. And I think anybody who, who's been to, not just in Nigeria, but any market, in any African city, I think it's the same thing. Mm. And, and they can spot you a mile away if they know you're kind of a bit unsure about My God. Who you're the price. <laughs> and they'll swindle you, swindle you no matter where you are, whether you're in Nairobi, Lusaka, what have you. I mean, Three things there. popped into mind when you're reading. One is um, in um, Professor Wallace Jurenkar's play, um, Death and the King's Horseman. There's a whole contingent of the play just happens in the marketplace, and it's just yeah. the most vibrant part. It's just it's just gorgeous. Well, thank you. I shall take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second is the amount of power um, that Fela Kuti's mother, Fumilai, and Nkwala Kuti mm. wielded through the market women in Abel Kuta was incredible. The, you know, 10,000 strong protests that she'd, she'd lead against the British government and colonial powers was incredible. And the third thing that it reminded me of is um, when I last visited Lagos, I went to Oshodi Market. I was wearing a T-shirt. Eh? The T-shirt, I purposely hadn't washed it in like three or four days. <laughs> you know, I, was, I was walking, you know, I hadn't combed my beard. So I tried to look, you know. Yes. Still, they called me, oh, you're a boy. <laughs> it's the most empowering thing in my whole life. Yeah, so those guys, they know. Yeah. There's an Indian. Your skin was too fresh. Yeah, it was too fresh. Yeah, it was too fresh. <laughs> oh, oh, wonderful. We've been given an extra five minutes, which is lovely. Yay. So does anybody Thank have you. another question? <laughs> oh, this gentleman here. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks for the conversation. Um, just wanted to ask a quick question. I'm a teacher. I teach in North London. And I've noticed... I noticed this over the 15 years I've been working with children anyway, but especially my last four classes, virtually all of the children that I teach, either their grandparents or their parents come from somewhere else other than England. Mm -hmm. And but one thing I noticed is that a lot of other communities do, but the children from particularly a Nigerian or a Congolese background tend to be the children that don't speak their languages. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I'm asking is considering you just mentioned something about language, do you think that 
as an African diaspora, are we doing these children a disservice by not teaching them their languages? Or for the, if you do have children or children in your family, how, how do you maintain that legacy? Because literally every other community, even those that have their parents were born in this country, you tell them to translate for somebody, and they're like, but most of the children from an African background, unfortunately. And I would include the Caribbean because people think that languages are not in the Caribbean, but they pretty much are, like Papiamento and St. Lucian Creole, and those things haven't been particularly passed down. So, yeah, that's really my question. Who sent you? <laughs> I sent myself. Which one of our parents sent you? <laughs> because... <laughs> I've been looking at you sitting there, like, <laughs> quietly. Then the minute I speak, you want to come and challenge. Somebody sent you. <laughs> Who sent you? Confess. Do you, know, do you know the funny thing <laughs> is that I was speaking to Rachel. when Remember, we had this discussion. So I said to Rachel, Rachel is bilingual because she, she, she and Viv, Viv, Viv. She and Viv mm -hmm. speak uh, multiple language. languages. Yeah. And I was saying, it's so wonderful that you're bilingual. And I said to Rachel before we came that I was in the station before we started this forum and I was in having a cup of coffee and a woman was sitting next to me and she was speaking German to her children. And just like that, the kids switched from German to English. And they were saying, oh, come on, mum, come on, mum. Then they switched to German. And I was just transfixed. So I said to the woman, I said, can I just say I applaud you for what you've done? that your children are bilingual, and my daughter's going to kill me because she's sitting here, but I did talk <laughs> about her. And she is the only one of my three kids who really has embraced speaking Yoruba and understanding Yoruba. And sometimes I'm scared about the things we say at home because I'm scared that she'll actually understand and pretend <laughs> she doesn't. Whereas my elder daughter's twin and my youngest, who's 13, don't speak it as much, though now the younger one is picking up. And I think it's because of people that she's at school with. So, excuse me, people that she's at school with, that, you know, they speak not just the slang and even non-Nigerian kids, I think mm -hmm. because from some of the music yeah. as well. Afrobeats, we have a lot to thank the Afrobeat musicians for because <coughs> the words are coming into the vocab. Mm. So, you know, I was saying to this woman how wonderful it is. She said it's because her husband is English and she's German. So she and her husband speak German in the house to the kids. But as soon as the kids are at school, they speak English and that's how they're bilingual. But I agree with you 100%. When I was growing up, I grew up both here and in Nigeria. In Nigeria, my Yoruba was fine. Then when I came here, it was kind of, mm. you know, rusty. And it's, I'm certainly not... No, fluent. don't but give I him know, back the microphone. But I know... Don't give him back. <laughs> but I know, tell me, because you've got young kids. Yeah, I've Can got you young kids. You? I, I, have a, I, have, I have two ch children. There's six years between the both of them. And I don't know what I did with the second one because she doesn't really speak at all. You know, she only understands commands. And when I speak in the imperative, like, go and wash your hands and go to sleep. You know, <laughs> and, and um, my son... I spoke to him Igbo continuously, like from when he was born, as soon as he slid out of me. And that's because I forced him to, yes, that image will live on with you. <laughs> um, but as soon as he came out, I forced myself to speak in Igbo because I didn't actually learn Igbo from when I was little because my parents spoke English to me and then I got back home to Nigeria and got properly bullied mm -hmm. by kids who didn't even speak a word of English. And in your secondary you know? school, were you allowed to speak vernacular? Because no, at we one weren't. stage, we weren't no, allowed we to when we were at school. Vernacular, but you I learned, speak your I, taught my, I, I spoke to Anika, my son, in Igbo constantly, you know, and when he went to school, he learned English in school. So I think a lot of the time it's two things, right? My partner at the time didn't speak Igbo, right? But I made it, I, I, I spoke Igbo to Anika constantly, right? And the difficulty was that he only got one side of the conversation. So if he wanted to ask me for water, he wouldn't say, may I please have some water? He would say, do you want to drink some water? Mm. Okay. <laughs> and now he understands Igbo perfectly, but he doesn't really speak anymore because he's the only one and I'm the only one in the house. So I think that is partly my failing in that I ceased, I seized, um, speaking to him in Igbo constantly because it was only me in the house speaking Igbo. Whereas my sister is with another sister and she has a group of 200 strong Anambra state, not just ordinary, not just <laughs> any other Igbo group, Anambra state people. Mm. And they're all like blah, 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 all the time. So they're much better off. So I think being able to see yourself in the community reflected definitely helps with the kids 
who speak Igbo now. But I think for our generation, it wasn't something that we were taught to take pride in. They didn't want you to speak Igbo. They wanted you to speak English and to speak it even better than the Queen does. You know? I think, yeah, there are a number of things that play. One is um, most of the government colleges, I went to Federal Government College of the Bully, for instance, a lot of them constructed after the Civil War did away with, with, with speaking vernacular. So yeah. the teachers weren't allowed to teach us Nigerian languages. So parents who grew up in that subsequently grew up with that mentality and didn't speak to the kids in that. My parents were from different parts of Nigeria. Between them, they speak maybe five or six Nigerian languages. But at home, the only language they spoke in common was English. So I grew up speaking that. So I think part of it is because of how transient we became and how much we mixed. And then in trying to find a common ground, a common ground we just settled for the colonizer's tongue. And with that, I'm really, really sad to say that we've had to, we have to now bring our session to a close. But I have to say, it's been wonderful moderating such a, an exciting and interesting and powerful discussion. I'm very funny. You need to you He's do going stand up. You didn't give me your name either. Yeah. He's putting on his coat to go away, sir. <laughs> but I'd like to thank all of you for being our audience here in the theatre. It's been wonderful having you here at the British Library in the Knowledge Centre at the British Library. Special thanks to all of you who watched online. Do remember you can get the book um, if you go to not just uh, Amazon, is it Hub? <laughs> bookshop.org yeah. thank you i didn't say the other name um, <laughs> and i do hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as i enjoyed moderating it thanks to chikadili and also to inua thank you very much thank and you. To thank, you. Thank, you thank you very much thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and um and once again um a reminder that if you want to give feedback do visit the link on the screen or scan the QR code outside. Um, feedback is really, really invaluable. So please do, you know, both the organizers, the Africa Rights um, and Royal Africa Society, but also those of us here on the stage, we'd love to hear your feedback. Good, bad, ugly, we'd like to hear it. Um, and if you'd like to support by donating, please do consider joining the Royal Africa Society, which will help ensure that Africa Rights continues. And also, can I say, a big thank you to Oren and Nancy for this wonderful talk. It's beautiful. Thank you.